Well, hello there. It's just me and the world's best tasting vodka. Guys, welcome to season three of Off the Dribble with your boy Byron Scott. I'm Byron Scott, the host <laughs> of the show. And today's guest is my boy. Y'all know him as Big Shot, and you should. If you don't know that name, there's something wrong with y'all. You've been under rock. <laughs> Robert Big Shot, or right, this man hit more big shots. It is known throughout the world as one of the best clutch shooters ever to play the game. Yeah. Teammate of mine way back in the day. Matter of fact, <laughs> I was on my last year with the Lakers. First year with uh, his. He was on his first year along with Kobe, Shaq. And D Fish, guys that you guys probably know about. Again, I want to welcome my man, mm-hmm. Big Shot, Robert Roy. Robert, you know how we do it. We always got to do yeah. a little toast. Welcome to the show, brother. Yeah. Appreciate Thanks, you brother. being here. Man, my pleasure. Mm. This, this is our good, you know, Neff vodka. Neff's that we good, like man. Drinking. That's that. That's that premium vodka right there. I better get about a, uh, a case of this to take <laughs> home with me. <laughs> you, read that, you hear that? He want a case of this. You know, people say, give me a bottle. I said, no, nah, I'm taking mine take to the a top. Case, huh? You know how I do it. I take it to the top. <laughs> so, Big Shot, you, you might have been one of the most successful players in NBA history. Besides, the only other guy I know, Bill Russell, yeah. who played 13 years in the NBA, won 11 championships, which is unheard of. But you did it in an era where there were so many more teams. Correct. Competition was so much better. You played 16 years in the NBA and won seven championships and three with the Lakers, right. two with the Rockets, two with the Spurs. And we were talking before we came on the air that if somebody didn't commit a, a, a foul, <laughs> <laughs> we might you would have had eight probably yeah. championships out of 16 years. Yeah. How, how does that make you feel to know that you are one of the greatest winners in NBA history? Uh, you know what? Let me start out by saying thank you for having me here. And I also want to say thank you for being you because I don't think you understand how much it meant to me when I first got to the Lakers and you took me to your house because I was new. You were showing me the ropes of LA, where to go and where not to go. So I want to put that on oh, record man. right now and thank say you, thank shot. you, man. You, I, pre- I appreciate that. You've always that. been, you know, growing up a Laker fan, you know, and then all of a sudden this is guy you love to watch play and he takes you under your wing, even though I was, you know, five, six years in the league, but you're like, come on, I'll show you around that way. Right. But that, 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 that made me feel good. I just want to start there. But oh, well, um, thank you. I you know, appreciate but, that. To me, when I when I got drafted by the Rockets, I always felt like that was the perfect situation for me. Mm-hmm. Because there's so many players that go to teams and they're like, okay, I want to play for this team because this, this, and this. I said, I want to play for this team because I was a big dream fan, but mm-hmm. I fit. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the biggest key. You have to fit in situations and every team I played on, I fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't like a, well, well, we got this guy, this team needs this, but it was for me, for me, it was fitting in the right place. And then also understanding who you playing with. Mm-hmm. Because when I was in Houston, every third play for me was ran for me. I knew I was going to get some plays. Right. So it, it makes you feel good as a player. <laughs> right, like, oh, right. I get a play ran for me. And then you come to the Lakers and you got all this talent. I'm like, can I get one play? You know what? <laughs> then you don't get any plays. And of course, you go to San Antonio, you don't get. But for me, it was all about the fit and, and then sacrificing and, and doing what's best for the team. And I think I, I always tell kids that I was the best player to sacrifice in order for a team to win because a lot of guys don't know how to sacrifice their right. game in order to win. And that's what you have to do to be winners. You can be the, the top dog, the middle dog, or the bottom dog, but you have to sacrifice in order for teams to win. You know, and I know that in my eyes that you and I had a lot in common, you know, when I played the game um, and you the same way. You could have went to a number of different teams and averaged 20 points a game. Hmm. You know, I know back in my day, I could have, you know, Jerry West was always one of those guys that's like, we could trade you. <laughs> you know, I, I got all these teams that want you. We could trade you and you could average 20, 24 points a game and and all this stuff. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. Yeah. You know, I, I want to win. You know, that's the number one thing. And I think we both had that in common. Yeah. Uh, but also, I, I think, a term that we use a lot now in the NBA, stretch fours. Nobody used that term back in those days. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And you were one of the first guys at 6'10 that could knock down threes on a consistent basis. How did that kind of make you feel nowadays knowing that that's that's kind of a a position, (laughs) you know, the stretch four? There's no such thing as power forward (laughs) anymore. It's a stretch four. It's just a stretch four. And and I go back to 95 when we really exploited it in the finals playing, um, you know, Shaq, Nam, Lee, Orlando. And it was just so much fun because people weren't used to guys 
that can, you know, cut, put it on the floor, pull up for three and do all these things. And Horace Grant, I love the guy, play with the guy one time. Oh, I, I, I love He Horace. couldn't guard me. Right, he, right. He was like, okay, <laughs> what is this guy? And, and I think Horace Grant was, you know, one of those guys that could do a little bit of everything, but he just couldn't pull out because he wasn't yeah. used to when I say pull out, pull out to the wing. I shouldn't say it like that, pull out, you know, but pull out to the wing. <laughs> <laughs> he could pull out to the wing. <laughs> Big shot, what do you mean with, by yeah. putting out? <laughs> Well, I, yeah, oh, okay, what yeah, you talking you about? Know, in this day and age, you got to be careful how you say everything because they'll take it like, yeah, what do you yeah. mean by that? Yeah, Big Shot yeah. was on Byron yeah. Scott podcast talking about pulling out. What the hell? <laughs> but, you know, that's the great thing about it. And, it, and Rudy T saw something in that when we had to play San Antonio in the Western Conference Finals where Dennis Rodman, people forget Dennis Rodman was on that team the year David yeah. Robinson won MVP. Yep. And, and Dennis was like, I'm not leaving the paint. They're like, he can shoot that all day. Go ahead. You knock down shots. And then when you got a guy like Dream in the post, you know, you got to double team him. So I think for me, becoming a stretch four kind of changed my life up, my game up. It also kind of kind of put me in a box, though, because now in, in Houston, I get a post yeah, yeah. But now it's like, oh, you're stretch three, stretch four, stay out there. I'm like, yo, I play center in college. I can post up. <laughs> and then as you mentally, you start saying, okay, well, all right, this is what I'm doing. And you in the summertime, you don't even work on post up right, moves anymore. Right. You work on everything on the perimeter right, either because that's what teams want you to do. And that's what you try what you try to get good at. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned, you know, in college you played your know, center because at Alabama, you still hold the record for block shots. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you was in college. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that because I don't I don't think a lot of people would understand the transformation that you had to go through from college and being in the paint all the time, blocking shots. And then you get to the pros yeah. with the Rockets. And you kind of mentioned a little bit and going from a post-up player to a guy who can just stretch the floor. Yeah. That had to be a big change in your game. Yeah. It, I have to credit my high school coach, his philosophy. If you can't beat someone one-on-one, -on -one, you're not a basketball player. Mm. And I'm like, huh? You know, you, because right, right. I was a post-up guy. I can take it off the, off the dribble. But I was. I tell my son, I say, you, you're a better ball handler than me because – I was one, two, three dribbles, and I'm pulling up because I'm taller than everybody, right, right. and I'm going to shoot over the top of you. So you had to learn how to, you know, change your game up. Um, you had to you know be more perimeter oriented. And I think the biggest difficulty I had being that was defense because mm. I wasn't used to coming off pick and rolls. You know, I'm used to guarding the pick and roll. I got to you know show and get back. But right, now right. you got guys like Sean Elliott, Grant Hill, Scotty Pippen, all these guys coming off pick and rolls. I got to get on top of this. I'm like. Can we just switch this? You know, <laughs> you know no. Which, that's what they do now. Yeah, that's what they do you now. Know. But it was just, I had to learn. I, mean, I, I know I credit for learning how to do it is Vernon Maxwell. Mm. Vernon Maxwell Mad was Max. excellent at coming off, you know, the pick and roll. He was like, Rob, you got to put your hand on the hip. When they go, you got to give them a little slight push yeah, yeah, so you can yeah. get under that screen. And he would sit there and, and practice and, and demonstrate with me. And, you know, because he knew I had problems with that. Right, right. And, you know, you, you you love great teammates like that that are, that are helping you with your weaknesses. And so for me, you know, in college, blocking shots, and it was just fun. You know this. When you're in the park growing up, blocking someone's shot is almost like dunking on someone. Right, you can right. talk someone's <laughs> trash. And I just I just love playing defense. And I, and I, I don't... I don't think people understand the defense I used to bring to the table my first four years yeah. in the league where I had yeah. to be small four and I could roam and block shots. And I always like to tell people, man, I was the first guy ever in the NBA. You know, you can say that. That's something. I was the first guy in the NBA to have 100 blocks, 100, 100 steals, and 100 threes in a season. So wow. take that. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. See, that's I, I just, yeah, that's the stat I like to tell wow. people. The next person that did it was Dirk Nowitzki. So, you know, it was, it was cool that I was the first. <laughs> wow. Big shot. That's that's tight. Yeah. I like that. I like that. You you brought this up a little bit because you you talked about guarding certain guys, and you you played in the era where you had a lot of guys at that small forward and that it well as we're gonna beast. continue to call it that stretch four <laughs> yeah. position that were Hall of Famers and All Star. Who was the toughest guy for you to guard on a night to night basis? It, it was so weird. I could just go down a, a list of guys because it was so many good guys. I remember one game I had to guard Grant Hill. Grant Hill Grant played 40 nice. minutes a game, and Rudy T was like, well, when he comes out, you come out. I'm like, hold on. He ain't came out yet. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm running all over right, the floor. And he I'm got coming the ball off these picking yeah. Yes, yes. And it was so hard. And then the next night, you're guarding Scottie Pippen, who's, you know, running the triangle, and you, you turn your head, he's cutting. Right, And all right. this kind of stuff. But I really hate guarding grandmama. 
nobody ever talks about how good Larry Johnson used to you be. You know what? You, you're right. He, Grandma Ma could take you in the post. He could stretch it out. He could put it on the floor. He was just a beast. And for me, being as skinny as I was back then, he would take you in the post, ground and pound, and turn around, Jay, up on there. I'm like, okay, Grandma Ma, I don't want to guard you no more. I really, let me go ahead and guard somebody else. But he was so tough to And guard. he was like that wide. Mm-hmm, those you know shoulders, what? man. But he, yeah. And he was such a good dude. Yeah. You know, that's the, mm-hmm. and, and for you guys out there that don't know, Grandma Ma is Larry Johnson. Yes. I, okay, that, that's Larry Johnson <laughs> with the University of North, uh, not North Carolina, he, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Yeah. Unbelievable basketball player, yeah. even a better person. But you're right, he was he was a guy that could take you down low. Mm-hmm. And smile at you while you Yeah, and smile at you the whole time. <laughs> he could take you on the three-point line, yes, smile yeah. at you the whole time. Mm-hmm. But the dude was a monster. That's, that's a great name. Yeah. That's a great name. Yeah. yeah Larry Johnson, I, you know, it's. I wonder what would have happened if his back didn't, didn't give him all up, those yeah. issues. And, and yeah. there's so many players like that. And speaking of backs, the era that when I came in, I got to, you know, play with you, play against you. And I think about all the greats. I was so pissed when I came in the league. That's when, you know, all the stuff went down with Magic, but he came back. Yeah, so yeah, I had a yeah. chance to play against him. <laughs> I had to play against Jordan, Dominique. But the one guy that I wanted to, because I'm, I'm saying this to say this, you want to measure yourself with oh, all the greats. The best. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was Larry Bird. Because yeah. you heard all the rumors about him. And I came in the league. I'm like, okay, I get play against Larry. Uh, what? Back? Yeah. And backs, when the guys' yeah. backs went out back then, it was a wrap. And yeah. so I, I never got a chance to play against him. So that was the one thing I missed because I remember playing against Dominique, which I was, you know, a fan of. Magic, who I was a huge fan of. And when you you measuring yourself, and you're taking stuff from them because you can watch tape, mm-hmm. but until you play them yeah, it, it don't and do understand no justice, the strength, yeah. the speed, and the size, Tape doesn't that doesn't doesn't work for you, right? Yeah. Right. You know what? It's funny because yeah, I I tell a whole lot of people this when they talk about you know great players and they bring up Larry Bird. I said, listen, the dude couldn't jump, mm-hmm. wasn't fast, you know, but wasn't athletic. Mm-hmm. But you look on the score you know, the, the <laughs> score sheet after the game, he got 25, 15 rebounds, nine assists, a few steals. I said the dude just knew how to play, yes. right? And the thing that I loved about him is that he was a shit talker. <laughs> See, I, and I wish you would have got a chance to play against him, Robert, because I swear yeah. to God, you would have loved playing against mm-hmm. him because the dude would just tell you where he's going, shoot it in your face, talk shit to you, and run back down the floor. Yeah. And he he was he was just one of those guys that, you know, he he had, he just had it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He yeah, had I it, about, and yeah. I saw it in college, and obviously saw it a whole lot closer mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when we get a chance yeah. to play against the Celtics. He was the biggest trash talker back in the day but he would back it up. Yeah, Rob, I wish you would have played against him, man. Larry Bird was the biggest shit talker in the league back in the day. <laughs> he would tell you exactly where he was going, what he was going to do. And he did that to us in the finals. He was like, guys, don't worry about it. I'm going to go right over here to the corner. I'm going to catch the ball. I'm going to shoot it. And ain't shit y'all can do about it. I mean, just like, and he did exactly that. You know, yeah. so I wish you would have got a chance to play against him. You know, because I always think about that moment. I don't know how true this is, but you remember the time when he was playing Atlanta and he told the guy, I, he says, I'm a bank of three on you. And the guy's is bullshit. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> on an out of bound play. Throughout the game, it was yep. one week, throughout the yep. game, he never got to say, he said, you know what? He goes back in the game. I think he had like 50 points that yeah, game or something. Up, Kevin, and, I noticed too, because Kevin McHale yeah. ended up having the most points ever scored by uh a Boston Celtic, mm-hmm. right? And Larry told him he should have got 60 because he broke it against Atlanta like yeah. two or three days later. <laughs> yeah, and it was in the bench. Atlanta bench got in trouble because they out here rooting for yeah. like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you can see it. If, yeah. I mean, if you go back and look at the tape, you can see the bench. Yeah. Every shot he made, yeah. they're going crazy. It's like, he unbanked this one. And it's like, see, that's what you want because when someone's telling you what they can do and you can't stop it, you know they a bad they're man. bad so, man. Yeah. But I, I look at guys in this era now and you, you say, okay, you look at Bird and says, "Well, I could have stopped him because you know he, he's slow." It's sort of like Luca now. Luca, yes. you watch Luca. Luca yes. is so freaking slow, and you like, why can't they stop that? Right. I'm like, yes. But when they, you crafty and you know how to play, that's all you. That's that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Bird is fast compared to Luca. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see Luca; he be going slow as hell, and he'll get by you. But mm-hmm. yo, Larry probably looked like fucking sprinter compared to, <laughs> to, compared to the way Luca plays. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You, when you left the league, when you retired after 16 years, you had played more playoff games than any player in the history yeah. of the NBA 
surpassing one of our favorites, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. How did how did that make you feel? That had to be a great achievement as well. Well, I could have had more games to that. So we, I'm in San Antonio, and you know, a lot of guys like to talk talk about records that are coming up, and they let the team. In, oh, I need this for this point. I didn't say anything. Yeah. So we in the playoffs, and all of a sudden, I get my first to nip, and I'm sitting there. We playing Phoenix, and I don't even go in the game. I'm like, what the fuck, man? You know, <laughs> but I don't say anything. So then, now, wait, you you playing for San Antonio? I'm playing for San Antonio. Okay, okay. To break the, this has been the game to break the record. Okay. And so I guess Tom James, who was a PR guy, tells Pop like, uh, you know, well maybe Robert can break it. He's like, Pop comes to me. He's like, why didn't you tell me you was gonna break the record? I said, first of all, I'm not going. I don't want to disrespect the record by getting some uh, shitty minutes. That's yeah, what I call garbage it. Time. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't yeah. put me in the game. Yeah. Put me in the right. game. Right. I like put me in the game because you want to play me, not to break a record. I don't. That's not fair to me. It's not fair to the record. It's not fair to the team. Mm -hmm. I was like, if I'm not in the game plan, just let me know. Right. Right. So the next game, he puts me out there, and I had like a steal, a block, a three. And he's like, well, shit, I should have played the last game. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you should have. I said, do you know who I am? I said, the regular season might be like this, but when the playoffs come around, yeah, you're a I'm a totally dude. different, dude. different yeah, dude. So, But, you know, the, the break Cap's record, and you think about all the games Cap played, all the seasons, all his accomplishments, the way he changed basketball, just to be able to break a record that was belonged by him, I ain't gonna lie, I felt great. <laughs> but, and then I said, then I was saying to myself, does it really count? Because, you know, we went to seven game series in the first round. Cap didn't do that in the first round. And I tried to tell myself to downplay it. It counted. It, it, but it counted, <laughs> you know, because you, I, I feel like Barry Sanders in that sense where there's certain people that you hold in such a high esteem that yeah. you want to keep them at number yeah. one. Yeah. But now you look at it, then Fish passed me and then LeBron passed him. So yeah. it kind of like, like mute now, like, okay, you know, I play house, you know what? Uh, <laughs> well, you're still gonna be up there for a whole for, for a long time. You're gonna be up yeah. in that top four or five of most wins in mm -hmm. NBA history. Yeah. Um, we we haven't talked about this, and I think it's been since his passing. But a, a real good teammate and friend of yours and mine, uh, the late great Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Um, that day, I mean, how did it hit you that day when you heard about Kobe? You know, uh, you know, dying in a helicopter accident. You know, for me, we were. We were, I don't know what we was getting ready to do, but my wife, my son, I think might be getting ready to go to the AAU game. Mm. And and I had just saw Kobe the week before and we were laughing and joking. He had, he was like, yeah, V here. You know, yeah, me and his wife, you mm -hmm. got to you know, go upstairs. Mm -hmm. I got to, you know, the little one with me. Because we were in the same tournament over mm -hmm. at, at Mamba Academy. And we getting ready. So we didn't even have the TV on. And then um, Justin, who is Candace, is my wife's nephew, calls and like is crying on the phone like what what's wrong i thought something had happened to either his you know candidate's sister or candidate's mom and he's like no 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 it's like what like kobe what oh no it's, no, it's fake news yeah. so we go and turn yeah. the tv on and i just sit there on the coffee table i'm like this shit ain't real it can't be real and then i just started crying because you hate for not i would i, I was crying because I, all i could think about is his parents yeah you know, people talk about Vanessa and talk about, but for me, after losing a daughter, you know how hard it is on his parents. And I, I started talking, then I thought about that immediately because of my situation. Then I thought about his daughter, started thinking about his girls and his wife and like, wow. And then I was like, dad, I just saw him, man. I'm like, wow, we were just talking, you know, laughing and joking about, you know, how much Cameron loved his, 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 I was about to say under armor, his um, body armor oh, drink yeah, and all yeah, this kind of stuff. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm gonna send you some, you know. It was just, we was just talking and laughing, man. So, well, good luck. And then, you know, I literally, you know, gave each other a hug and said, well, we'll see you around the circuit, right? right, right. And then it was just, it was, it was so unreal for me. And even when they asked me to come in the studio to talk about Kobe, I still felt like it was fake news. I just feel like this is not real. And it's just so hard when you you see such a person who went from being, you know, tunnel vision, I like the car, because mm -hmm. he was only about his craft. He was, drift, he was only about, he was about, all yeah. about being the best. Yeah. And then his, that vision story opened up where he became a better teammate. Um, you know, he became, a, you know, a better father, a, a better husband, a better person. And I don't mean it in the sense that, you know, when I say better, I mean, he went from being great to greater. So mm -hmm. better can, you know, so because I know a lot of people are like, what do you mean by better? I'm like, I mean, he's got even better than what he was. Right, right. And so, uh, and and for him to just be this guy who, 
became more open and honest with people mm-hmm. was like, you know, why didn't I play with this guy? I played with number <laughs> eight. He was, I would have loved to got to know this guy, the fun loving guy who could put a smile on me. Because you think about when he was when he was number eight, he was just, you know, driven. Yeah, like you said, he was, he was driven. driven to be the best. And you respected that. Yeah. And you, you know, you play with him and you honor that. And you came to practice each and every day. And you try to give him the business, you know. And and I, I'm gonna tell a little fun story, but we we knew how driven Kobe was. Mm-hmm. So we you you remember the game, we, the string game we used to play, right? Mm-hmm. And Kobe couldn't shoot threes back then, right, so he would right. always get beat. And we'd get to <laughs> practice, he down there shooting three. Yo, guys, can we play? And we'd be like, nah, we ain't playing today. <laughs> and he would get mad because he wanted revenge, right, right? right? And then we'll wait like two or three, okay, we'll play today. Then he gets beat again, and he'd go right back in the lab trying to get better. And it was just one of those things, like we used to mess with him so much about things he couldn't, he could not do. And that dude would be in the gym next morning, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., trying to prove us wrong. Just, oh, I, you think I can't do that? I'm going to go work on it. Yeah. And that's, that's what made him great, man. Because I played with a lot of superstars, Hall of Famers, that they wouldn't work on their weaknesses. Yeah. This dude worked on every weakness he had. Yeah, I tell people when, when you talk about KB, the work ethic is unmatched. Yeah. And, and like you, I've played with a bunch of great players, Hall of Famers, mm-hmm. top 75, you know, all that. <laughs> And, and not to say that they didn't work hard. Mm-hmm. You know, I know Akeem worked hard. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Magic worked his ass off. James worked his ass off. Cap worked it. But this dude, he, he took it to a whole different level. Yeah. And, and I was blessed to see that my last year with the Lakers. And, I, you know, I'm sitting there watching this kid, and I'm going, man, this dude, this, this yeah. dude is going to be unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but you know, I understand, though, it's like if you think about all the things he accomplished in his life and the things he did – in his stories, he had to have another guy, man. He didn't sleep at all because he, he was everywhere. He was doing so much charity work. He was doing so shot. many things for people. I'm like, dude, man, when do you sleep, big man? Big shot. The dude, <laughs> like you said, and, and a lot of the charity work, like mm-hmm. you said, that he mm-hmm. did, he he did that, you know, way beyond the cameras and all yeah. that stuff. He wasn't trying to get publicity and all that. He was just doing that because that's something that he loved to do yeah. and something that he had a, a passion for. But, you know, that, that last year I coached him, right? He would text me at like four in the morning, like, Coach, what are we doing for practice tomorrow? And I, and I would wake up at six, right? And I look, I said, what the fuck? You texting me at four in the morning for, man? Oh, I was up and I was like, Kobe. And, and like you, I say, Kobe, do you sleep? Man? And he's straight like this. No, not really. You know, <laughs> he said, I'm working on this. I'm working on that. I'm, man. I was like, man, you got to get some sleep. I said, but, but, but by the way, we ain't really doing a whole lot today in practice. So you ain't got to come if you don't want to. But if you come in, I ain't going to let you do a lot either. You know what yeah, I'm saying? I'm trying yeah. to save you and get you to the end of this season mm-hmm. so you can play that yeah. last game, right? Yeah. So he he was just one of those dudes that's just I, – I never met, never seen anybody that that went at it every day like it was his last day. Yeah. You know, and that was amazing. I, for me, I just I, – I marvel at the fact that he could add anything he wanted to his game because – there's a lot of guys, I don't care who, how good you are, you just can't add it to the right, game. You just right. don't have that skill set. Right. And for him, though, he could add whatever he want to his game. You know, for me, that's why it makes him, you know, in my list, top three players of all time. So, I, I agree with yeah. you. I remember he he wanted to learn how to play in the post. He called Akeem. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? He, yeah. he called a dream because he, he felt Dream had the best footwork of any big man he he's ever seen. About, he's like, you know, that's a, I think that's the first conversation we ever had. Like, you know, how was it, tell me about Dream. How was how, how was it to play with him? How about his footwork? I'm like, soccer. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and Dream had the best footwork. And, yeah. so, and he was always trying to learn. And and and, and uh, this is the, after my first year of retire, um, you know, when you walk away from the game, you kind of away from the game. Mm-hmm. And then I took Cameron, my middle son, to a game, and this is when my camera was trying to play basketball, we trying to transition from basketball to football. He's playing both. And we went to a game, and we were talking to Kobe and Fish after the game in the locker room. And he says, Cam, how you doing? Like, good. How's the game coming? He says, okay. And he looked at me like, and he, says, he looked at Cam like, you know, your dad is one of the smartest players I ever played with. And then Cam looked at me with this bewildered look. <laughs> this dude? I'm like, dude, I, I, I'm, I know how to play the game. <laughs> And so I said that because, you know, as parents, right. you know, we try to teach our kids so many things that they just won't listen. They don't, yeah, they won't listen. They think they know it already. Yeah, if there's someone they admire and then they, they tell you, like, oh, your dad or your mother or whoever was, was this good, and they're like, okay, I, now they have my right. attention. And so 
I tell that story because I had Cameron's attention for two weeks on how to play basketball. After two weeks, she was like, ah, he went back to, you don't know what you're talking yeah, about, Dad. Back to his normal <laughs> self. <laughs> yeah. That's kids. Yeah. That's kids. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to mm-hmm. be back with, with more with my boy Rob Big Shot Ori in a few minutes. Yeah. Black Widows are conglomerates of attorneys and investigators that have always been community-based. They started from a personal traumatic loss, and that has spiraled into a platform from human dignity and rights. When they say there is no chance, Black Widow will take matters into their own hands and will find a way to rectify the wrongs and produce positive results beyond any boundaries while also paying it forward. Black Widow handles motorcycle injuries, car accidents, trips and falls, all criminal matters, family law, workers' compensation, restraining orders, and all other legal matters. In an industry where money rules and basic given rights are overcome by greed, they strive to make it about humanity by repeatedly educating and informing the masses as to their rights. If you have ever felt that raging anger like you've been done wrong, that's the fire that fuels this team. When you're done listening to all the rest, call us for the blunt truth. Call 844-NO-CHANCE or reach out via our Instagram at blackwidow underscore investigations. When others say no chance, we're on your team. Welcome back, guys. We're back with the uh, season three, another edition of the Byron Sky Show off the dribble with the Byron Sky Show. <laughs> and I'm here again with my boy Rob Big Shot Ori in the house. Uh, we've been talking about Kobe and now, I mean, great conversation. We both got unbelievable memories of Kobe. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you said something that, that, that kind of stuck with me when we talked about the death of Kobe, you said the first thought that you had was to his mom and dad. Mm-hmm. And I know exactly why you lost a, a, a daughter at a very early age. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine. So, you know, I, I'm asking you this because I know how strong you are as a person and I know how strong your wife and your family or as, as people, how how hard was that? And I, and I know it's a stupid question. How hard was that mm-hmm. to deal with, you know, the loss of a child? Because that's the worst. That's a parent's worst nightmare. Yeah, you know, f- for us, when she was born, she was missing part of her first chromosome, which is called. It didn't even have a name back then. That's mm-hmm. how rare it was. Now it's called um, one P thirty six deletion syndrome. You know, mm-hmm. it didn't really have a name. It's just right. what it, what the, you know the syndrome is, and. My, my my former wife and I, we was like, you know, trying to figure it out. And this was going on during, you know, the NBA Finals in 94. And people right. were like, and we didn't talk about it. You know, it wasn't social media then where everybody right. can get in your business right. and find right. out stuff. And I spent so many nights in the hospital, you know, leaving the hospital, going to practice and going home. And it, it was very, very difficult. But, I, but as she got older and got a little bit stronger, it made me realize that you can go out and do certain things and it's nothing compared to what she has to live with. Mm-hmm. You know, not be able to say certain, you know, not be able to speak, you know, she could sign, not be able to, you know, feed her, she had to feed her through a G button. We all, we, she had all these things that we had to do, but she always had a smile on her face. I mean, she could be hurting and she's going to come to you and smile and then she might smile and tell you that, you know, point to a spot where it was hurting and it, it was it was really difficult with my first wife. And I think that's probably one of the things that kind of, you know, pulled us apart because she handled it one way, I'm handling it one right, way. Right. And the communication wasn't fully there. But it did bring us together in the sense of, you know, having compassion for others. Mm-hmm. And and I and I go back and look at my life and I feel like God put a lot of things in my pathway to get me to this situation. My mom taught special needs kids because she was a teacher. Um, I was in this, you know, I was in, I wanted to be a teacher in college. So I had this one kid named Walt Gary that had Down syndrome and he was attached to me when I was doing my student teaching. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one that could get him to do the things he was supposed to do. And it's almost like these were things that God, you know, like they say, they don't, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. Right, right. And I think he, he put all these little breadcrumbs to help me on my path to when we got Ashland. And so I, um, they told us when she was born, she wasn't going to make it past two. You know, we had her for 17 lovely years and we wow. we happy we had her with us in our lives. And, and my um, ex-wife, she, you know, she wrote a book about it called A Glamorous Sacrifice. And because 
people outside, when I say outside, outside the NBA, they always see the money. Mm-hmm. They think the money can fix anything. But when you when your child has a syndrome that can't be fixed, you know, no matter how much money right. you've got in the world, right. you can't right. fix it. But would you give it all up to make sure she was 100% healthy? You, you, in, a, in, a, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Yeah. And it just made us stronger. I remember so many times during that finals and during that whole, my whole career um, that she was down and out, you know, we go on a plane and all of a sudden we're on a plane going somewhere and she starts turning blue because she can't breathe. And it was so many things where we had challenges and we had to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, next thing you know, we have to do the, the hardest decision in our life is which we should do a DNR. And, you know, DNRs do not resuscitate because she had gone through so much pain in her life that we knew that the next one was going to be the worst one. Mm. And so for us, you know, sitting there and being asked who she was, and when she took her last breath, she smiled. And we had this thing, sorry for, you know, tearing up. We had this thing that she and I would always do she would love to come lay on top of me and do the kissy thing with her eyes. And, like, and it was like a butterfly kiss. Yeah, yeah. And so, and of course, right before, it was just so weird because the nurses woke us up and like, it's time. And I'm like, what? She's about to go home. And so I laid there. Sorry. And I did the butterfly kiss with her. And she did the biggest smile. It took a last breath. And for me, I, I, it sticks with me because that was our thing. And when you have, I'm sure you have something with your kids. That's oh. like each kid, you have this thing with your kid. You have this thing with your kid. And that was our thing. And for her to give me my butterfly kiss right before she went home was a, was a special moment for me. And it was so many times that I'm glad I retired when I retired. Because people don't understand sports, especially basketball, it takes you away from your family. Yep, yep. You miss so many special moments, you know. And when I retired, I was there for her as much as I could be. And and, and you have to explain to her brother, Cameron, was like, you're going to go through a lot of stages in life when your sister passed. You're going to be angry. You're going to be mad. But you got to understand at the end of the day, God has a plan. And I think for us, after going through that, it made us realize there's nothing that as difficult as it seems to be if you think about what your sister and your daughter had to go through. And I think my best friend, Keija, when he gave the um, eulogy for her, he's the one that pointed that out. And I was like, and then so many people like, yes. we never." And I never thought about it like that, that her smile and understanding what she had to go through made so many people stronger just from knowing her, knowing that she was, you know, not healthy, in and out of the hospital, but it made them realize that, oh man, I got a flat tire. Shit, that ain't that bad. Right. You know, right. compared to what Ashton had to go through. Right. So and I could go on and on and talk about it, but it's just one of those things that I I I, I don't wish that on my, anybody to, to have to, you know, go to the hospital and sit there for six months straight as their daughter's or their son or their baby's trying to fight for their lives. So it was hard. And, you know, I missed her each and every day, but, you know, she she made me a better person, made me stronger. She gave me, she made me have compassion for a lot of people that I wouldn't normally have. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it, it's, it's heartbreaking just to hear you talk about her, mm-hmm. you know, and to go through what you went through. And like you said earlier, God only gives you as much as you can handle. Yeah. You know, and I've always said that I don't, I don't know if I could handle that, yeah. you know, losing losing a, a child. Uh, and Rob, I, I remember, you know, when she passed, I was like, wow, I, you know, I, I felt so bad for you, you know, knowing you the way I do mm-hmm. and the type of person that you are. You know, I, I just couldn't imagine. But brother, you've uh, you, you've done unbelievable things with your life. Uh, her spirit is obviously still in you mm-hmm. and it's going to be until you until you leave this earth. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Uh, and it, I think it shows in what you're doing now. I mean, you have your AAU team. You know, you 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 uh you, you still around kids. You still love kids, 
Uh, I want to talk about your AAU team, but I also want to talk about, ha- have you ever given any thought to coaching? Because, uh, again, when you have one of the greatest <laughs> ever in Kobe, and, and I played with you, so I know how smart of a basketball player you were. You, you ever thought about coaching on this level or, or, or even in the co- on the uh, collegiate level? You know, I, I, I've always wanted to coach from day one. I would take, I'd be in the gym and see a kid doing something wrong. I'd go over there and help him out. <laughs> just yesterday. Yeah, that's I'm a coach. The, yeah. I'm just yesterday, <laughs> and, and I think this kid can be no older than one or two. I'm over there <laughs> playing with him, you know. Because I just have a love and a passion yeah. for it, man. Um, from, from day one, I, I think from when you have to go to, we used to have this thing called play school, and I'm from Andalusia, Alabama. We didn't have the why. You know, all you talk about all these mm-hmm. basketball players that grew up and they have a why. We didn't have a why in this small town. We just had something called play school. It was our high school where all the black kids went. It's like mm-hmm. it's basically the summertime when parents got to work. Oh, we right. need a place for yeah, them to right, go. Right. Here's, we go <laughs> here's your summer camp. Here's your summer go camp. Play right here. Yeah. <laughs> and we and I just had a passion for working with kids and you know having fun with that and you know to see a kid you know going from not be able to shoot a free throw to be able to knock three or four down in a row in a row. And I even taught swimming lessons. You know, wow, as you really? don't know that, I, I, like I had kids I would take to the pool, uh, teach them how to swim. And uh, like one guy was like, coach, you got to teach me how to dive. And so I taught him how to dive and all this kind of stuff. And yes, yes, black folks can swim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so. going to say, say, I was gonna say <laughs> some, because I can't. I'm going to tell you straight up, most of us can't. So Rob, yeah. <laughs> Rob being one that can and teaching, yeah. that, that's a damn uh, accomplishment. <laughs> so it, I just always had that passion. I, I remember the, the, when I got um college and, you know, I didn't the thing about coaching in college, you got to have your degree. Right, right, right. And I just recently got mine. You know, you, Congratulations. Know, you don't even know this. I saw you get yours. Yep, I'm about to I say, saw you I get yours. Recently, well, a couple of years ago, no, I got mine. Yeah, That's I right. saw you got That's yours. Right. And I, and that was right. You got yours right before the pandemic, right? I sure did. And I, I remember that. And right, I was like, no, I got it during the pandemic. Oh, because, yeah. Because I went back and I got it during the pandemic. Okay. And I had just one counselor that I had to talk to, went online, got all my classes. Mm-hmm. Boom, got yeah. it right during the pandemic. Because then you take a picture in front of your mantle with yes, it. Yes, I did. And I saw that and I was like, you know, damn it, I can do that too. <laughs> and I only had I only had eleven hours. Oh man, when so I, I had left 18. school. See, I had eleven hours when I left school. And people forget, you go to you go it's to school. Semester. Yeah, you go to school because school is the education to get you a good job. Right. And shit, right. hell, we had one of the best jobs ever. In the world, yeah. And so for me, I was like, ah, I get it later. I get it later. You know, 25 years later, I could finally go back and get it. And now I said, okay, I can coach in college. And the reason also behind that is Christian, my youngest is 16. I said, you know, I might have to do the, um, the uh, what's this guy named play at Tennessee? He coach, he's uh, uh, Allen Houston. You know, I might oh, do the Allen he, Houston thing where his dad, his dad was his the coach. head coaching job. Yeah. And next thing you know, the player goes there and yeah. he has a good career. So I right. said, you know, I need my degree to coach in college. But I, I, I kind of wanted to do it. I remember when Kurt, you know, your former teammate, he called mm-hmm. me up. And this kind of rolls back to the situation with my daughter. He called me up when he went to Minnesota. He says, hey, I want you to be one of my assistant coaches. Mm-hmm. And that's when Ashland had got really, really sick. And I was like, I, I can't. I just can't leave her now. You know, I just can't go to Minnesota. And so... I've always had that passion. Even last season, the Lakers brought me in to, you know, to interview about being a coach. And I was like, uh, I was like, mm, you know, it's hard because you want to do it. You have the passion to do it, but it takes a lot of time, man. Yeah. yeah. It it's, takes it's, a, it's lot a lot of work. time. Yeah, it's and, a lot of work. And, you know, I don't have that much gray yet. <laughs> and so you, hey, you start coaching, you start will. Coaching. That's why I, I cut my hair. I, I was like, I, I don't want you Ty, to see all the gray I, I got up there. I look at Ty Lue and I be like, you know, I play with you, Ty. You, and I'm like, I'm like 10 years, you know, you look older than me now. Is that from coaching? <laughs> <laughs> Genetics, you know. But, I, you know, I, I have the passion for it. I want to do it. But I'm like at that point now, can I um, coach and not travel? Yeah, right. <laughs> if I can do that, yeah. then I can do that. Yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, yo, yeah. bitch, I don't know if that's gonna happen. You, get, you might just do a little traveling at least. You know what I'm saying? Only playoffs. I only oh, travel in playoffs. playoffs. <laughs> yeah. You know me in the playoffs. You can be a special <laughs> assistant. They'll be like, you know what? Uh, just just coach the home games. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then the playoffs. Yeah. You, know, you just got to find that perfect situation. Exactly. <laughs> Well, how how is your AAU team doing? I know I know you have a passion for that. I know you you're you know, running that. How's that going? You know, it it was it was going good to the point where I got like you know, it's the part when you have an AAU team, it's so hard to find a gym. Yeah, because yeah. you have to, and then you, and I felt bad because I had kids coming from Calabasas, I had kids from yeah. here, kids from there, and it's like okay, you know, how do we? And you try to find a gym midway, 
And then you get to a point it's like, man, you know what? Let's just do this for fun. Let's just go out and play. And now they know most of them in high school now. It's like, you know what? Let's just, you know, wait and see what we're going to do. And now every, every kid is like, when are we going to start back up, coach? When are we going to start back up? I'm like, eh. <laughs> I got my own thing I want to do now. You know what I mean? I got to go here and do NBA TV. I got to go to right, Spectrum. Right. I got to do all this kind of stuff. I'm like, I'm trying, because I was doing it for free. Right. And so right. I'm like, man, you know what? I did that. I think I want to make me some money now. Right. <laughs> understand. Yeah. Understand. So you, you just you just hit on it just a second ago, NBA TV Spectrum. How are you enjoying being a basketball analyst as well? Well, you know, when we used to do it together, yes, I did. never thought I would be an analyst. Here's a country boy from Alabama with that country slang sometime that comes out, you know what I mean? And so... <laughs> you mean just like that? <laughs> you know, I know the, the Cali people don't understand what I'm saying sometimes, but man, just bear with me. You'll get the gist of it. So I, I never thought I'd be an analyst. I, I never envisioned myself that because if you watch me from a little kid growing up, I wasn't a big talker. Mm -hmm. In college, I wasn't a big talker. I would, you know, I would yell at my teammates and whatever, but that was about it. I wasn't one of these guys that's gonna give up and give the, the speech in the locker room. We gotta do this and right, do this. Right. So I do, do your job. Right. That's how I was, right? <laughs> Straight to the point. Right, right. And then as I started doing this, I was like, okay, I like this. It's fun. Yeah. You're still yeah. around the game. Yep. You're still involved. You still got that love and passion, but it's directed to in, in a different way. So. I love doing it. I never thought I would do it, but I'm so happy I'm doing it. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it was some of the funnest times I had at Spectrum when it's me, you, and Big Game <laughs> on there with Gita, you yeah. know, having a good time, talking about the game, have time, we go get a little something to eat, come back, get ready for the, th you know, for the second half. Yeah. Had a lot of fun. So I knew you was going to be doing it for a while. I was like, Rob and James going to be doing this for a while. 11, I, I 11 years it. later. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you're yeah. still doing it. Yeah. So, so Big Shot, you know, we, we're kind of coming to the end of this great podcast of being able to have some time with you, brother. And the, the one thing that I, I want to say, you know, besides that year when you came to LA and we hung out a little bit, you came over and ate all my food and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you invited. <laughs> I go pass us some free food. And, you know, Jewish, AC was the same way. I invited yeah. AC. But the, the, the biggest difference between you and AC is AC wouldn't leave. <laughs> See, you went back. You did your thing. You know, I would call you like a hey, big, big shot. What you doing tomorrow? You, you, you free? You want to come over? <laughs> AC would just show up. You know, all I hear is a knock on the door and I look at the door. He's like, you got some more food left in the fridge? I mean, he, he, he was like that. Mm. Uh, but I say that to say this, you know, since then, you know, the one thing we haven't had a chance to do is sit down and talk. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, there, there's been 20 plus years that's gone by since then. And, you know, I'm retired doing my thing. You retired doing your thing. You're doing great things. You know, great family, great career NBA wise. Uh, now you're doing great on Spectrum and NBA TV. What are some of the other things that you're involved in uh, that your fans would love to know about? I think the most interesting thing I, that I'm doing with my podcast, I actually, it's kind of weird. I do two podcasts. Oh, my God. <laughs> I do two podcasts. See, two podcasts. I got the, I got the Big TV, Shot Bob Spectrum. podcast. Yeah. I like that one, though. <laughs> the Big, Big Shot, Shot Bob. Bob. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the one we try to have guests on and have a little fun. You know me. I like to make light of little things mm -hmm, and have mm -hmm. fun with it because that's just a way to express yourself, you know. And another podcast is called, this is the cool one because we just talked about this earlier. It's called, you know, the NBA Finals File. Mm -hmm. And it's hosted by Jabari. The other one, I have B, B Dog, and then I have Rob Jenner's on the other one. Rob Jenner's and B Dog used to work with Shaq on his. And okay. now I kind of slid in that, that position. So, but this one's actually interesting because it's the Finals File. And our first, our first, um, Breakdown was your finals in '84 playing Boston. Even though y'all y'all lost that one, right? Yeah, we did. You was a rookie, right? I was. You didn't play that much, right? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring you know, all, bring <laughs> all that shit up, big, big Rob. Go ahead, just bring all that shit up. Right. This, rookie I'm, lost. Uh, no, didn't but play I'm, much. Yeah, bring all that I'm up. Like, yeah. No, but it's weird because I'm watching the game. Like, why does he play Byron more? <laughs> Let him get some shots up. He can guard DJ. He can guard. Like, it's like what's the other point guard they had that I was like um, uh, his um, son Matthews. Was it Matthews? No, they had... Yeah. Uh, they they had play, uh, his son played in the NBA for a while. Point guard. Uh, uh, Gerald Henderson. Gerald Henderson. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what? And it was... And so I was looking... At, I'm, we analyzed and breaking down this series, and I realized that, damn, y'all played fast back then, <laughs> man. I'm like, wow. I was like, damn, Larry Bird was good. And I'm yeah. like... And then I'm also saying to myself, 
Kevin McHale was inconsistent. How he's one of the best power forwards there. I'm like, <laughs> is that because James was locking him up, or is that because um, other things that were going on? I'm like, but I really realized in that game that uh, after watching that game, and you always talk about unsung heroes. We all know how good DJ was, Bird. Yeah, yes, but. Chief was a bitch in that series, bad. man. Chief you know? was a bad dude, man. And I was like, wow. I, I always think that, oh, he was just out there to play defense on cap. But the Chief was getting Chief, buckets. Chief was nice. So, and that's the one good thing. But I, I say that to say this. It's the one good thing about doing that because you get to take time now. You have to break down the games and look at everybody and analyze mm -hmm. it. And it makes you appreciate every player that's ever played yeah. this game. There's so many players that go out through their careers. They win championships. And... You're like, oh, because there's somebody on that team that's in that upper echelon, and you don't think about them. You know, mm -hmm. you think about, oh, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, but I'm like, and DJ, I'm like, man, Robert Parrish, Robert Parrish was a bad. beast, man. Yeah, that boy's and, a bad and, it, man. And, and doing this has made me appreciate so many things about basketball, the rhythm of the game, the, the, the chess matches that go on in the game, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. the guys who just have heart. Yeah. Because yeah. there's so many guys that just have heart that they're like, you know what? You're not going to beat me tonight because you just beat me last night and I got to come with it, man. Yeah. So it, it's this, it's been a blessing to do that. And other than that, that's been, I think my biggest and, and the funnest thing that I'm doing is being an ambassador for the NBA. Yeah. I get to go to Abu Dhabi in this yeah. month, so I'm excited, man. So you know, that's Can I go the best with thing. You? Yeah, Abu Dhabi. I've been I've been wanting to go to Dubai. Yeah, so, man, I might have to, I might have to jump in your suitcase or something. Shit. So oh, it, you know, man. It's, it's just been a. It's just you know what? I think if I had more fun retired than I did in the NBA because yeah. I literally the NBA has opened up so many doors for me to travel, to meet people, to do podcasts, and 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 and, and, and plan for LA is, you know, the cherry on all of that because, oh, yeah. you know, you think about all the people you get to meet that you, you know, you grow up admiring and looking at. Think about it. How many people can say we can just walk up to Denzel exactly. and have a conversation? <laughs> so what's up, he, Denzel? And, and he'll be talking yeah, right back to you. Yeah, yeah, and he's like this, oh, you know, he's yeah, excited exactly. to see you. So exactly. I, you know, I, and that's that's from playing in the Laker uniform, yeah. man. So I am, I, I am so blessed in all the things that I was able to witness and accomplished because of the NBA. So, um, you know, I can go on days for days, but we, I know we got to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, y'all got to check, you got to check Big Shout Out, you know, on his podcast <laughs> as well. And watch him break down those NBA finals back in the day. And like he said, game, you know, yeah, I, the one thing I loved about that is he, he is a studier of the game of the NBA. He studies the game. He knows the history of the game. And that's that's so big. It's too many young people that come in the game today. They're in the NBA. You mentioned the name. They'd be like, who's that? Yeah. He's like, you don't know the history of the game? So it, it's so important for young people to understand where they, you know, yeah. look, where this game has come from to this particular point is, is amazing. I have to tell you a little story. I have to, it's a story like, you know, you talk about the history. Yes. Um, when I was, you know, trying out, doing my trials to come in the league, you know, you had to fly to all these different teams. <laughs> and, I got here to LA and it's oh, we're gonna make you play one on one with someone. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I think it's another uh, guy who they're looking at. And I watch Magic. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to be cool and calm. I'm like, Magic John, I'm about to be one on one. <laughs> and so we playing one on one, right? I'm saying, I just wanna block his shot, right? Man, I'm almost throwing my shoulder out of socket trying to block the shot. And I don't think the dude ever jumped over two inches and wore my ass out. I'm, and after I left boop. that thing, I was like, boop. I gotta get smarter. Yeah. It ain't about it ain't about the physical attributes. You have to be a smart player. And leaving that, I said, I gotta be a smart player. But then I left there and I go to Denver for a trial. And they were talking like, I'm like, I don't even know who the coach is. That's right. what I said in my interview. I was like, I'm sorry, like Dan Issel. I'm like, who the fuck is Dan? I'm like, I'm like, I don't know who Dan Issel is. And he was and Dan <laughs> and like, was like big yeah. in Denver. And I'm like, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm like, I said, I'm I say, I'm from Alabama. We don't get the NBA. I said, I worked on I worked with the class and I went to practice. I ain't have time to look at the NBA. I'm sorry. I don't know who Dan Nissel is. And then I'm like, then I go back and I'm like, damn, Dan Nissel was a bad yeah, man. He, Dan Nissel could and, play. Yeah. And then when I get to Phoenix and they were talking about um, uh, the Hawk, I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know who the Hawk is. You have to, <laughs> but it's a point to what you're saying. These guys now have access. Yes. I didn't have access yes. back then. Yes. So you need, with that access, they need to go out and, and research and do what Kobe used to do. 
you know, Kobe knew players. I'm like, who is that? He knew everybody. Yeah. You want to know what interesting thing is? Who knew everybody also? Yao. Really? Yao. I'm sitting there one time with Yao. Not yo. Yao Ming. Not yo. Yao Ming. <laughs> Yao Ming. And we're talking basketball. And he's telling me, I'm like, how in the hell you know all this? I don't, man. I, right, I'm right. in the United States. Like, Yao. And he, and he was a very smart dude. And he studied the game and knew the history of the game very well. You know, even though he didn't have a long career, but it's like him and y'all are the two people I know could tell you everything about everybody who's played this game. Kobe wow. and y'all. Yo, I, I know. I, Kobe, I would have guessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have I know. Guessed. That's, yeah. It's like we always had those interesting facts. Interesting fact, B. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, again, we want to thank my boy Robert Big Shot Ori for being our guest today. Big Shot, we love you, dog. Not as much as love I love you, you from day one, Appreciate my brother. You, you know Appreciate me. Appreciate you. Took Guys, me into your home. Let me eat your food. That's right. Let it, and free. <laughs> I didn't even charge <laughs> Guys, this is another episode of Off the Dribble. I'm your host, Byron Scott. Until mm -hmm. next time, guys, enjoy your day, and we'll see you soon.